America's Voice, turning talk into action. Tonight on America's Voice, at 6, it's the Michael Reagan Show. Then at 7, watch Armstrong Williams, followed by America's Voice tonight. America's Voice, turning talk into action. I'm Oliver North, and you're watching America's Voice. Tonight on America's Voice, at 7, watch the Armstrong Williams Show. Then at 8, it's America's Voice tonight. America's Voice, turning talk into action. This is Shirley Calhoun from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and you're watching America's Voice. In legal news today, the Senate confirms more Clinton judges and a state appeals court says pregnant women can refuse medical treatment for their preborn children. Welcome to Legal Notebook. I'm Tom Jipping. And I'm Kathy Cleaver. What kind of judge does America need on the federal bench? And does the current process do for picking them on the job? Stay with us. with Tom Chipping and Kathy Cleaver. Are you tired of playing Twister with messy rope, tape, and twist ties? Then you need the Handy Bundler, the world's first endless tie wrap dispenser. No matter what the size, Handy Bundler tightens to a perfect fit every time. It's lightweight, fits comfortably in your hand, and secures anything as easy as one, two, three. No more tangled rope, messy twist ties, and sticky tape. Now neatly wrap cable and TV wires for a better appearance. Tie garbage bags tight in seconds. Secure luggage to the car for safe travel. Look, ordinary tie wraps just aren't long enough, but the Handy Bundler's cord extends to any size. Large or small, it wraps them all. It's perfect to clean up newspapers. Wrap audio and speaker wires. Take Handy Bundler outdoors to support tomato plants, train ivy, or bundle an out-of-control garden hose. Keep one in your car for roadside repairs. You can even protect children from dangerous places. Take Handy Bundler to work to tame the wildest computer cables. Secure boxes for shipping. The Handy Bundler is ideal for crafts. Make your own dried flowers. Neatly store holiday lights. Decorate for any festive occasion. And the Handy Bundler is virtually indestructible. Even the law can use Handy Bundler to detain criminals. You'll find hundreds of uses for the Handy Bundler around the shop, at home, in the office, and on the job. Now, in this limited time offer, you get the Handy Bundler. Over 50 feet of durable nylon strapping that'll hold just about anything. And 100 locking clips, all for only $19. 95. And it comes with this guarantee. Use Handy Bundler, and if you're not convinced it's the best tool ever, return it for a full refund of the purchase price. Order now. Have your credit card ready and call 1-800-656-4499. Or send 1995 plus 595 shipping to Handy Bundler, P.O. Box 2987, Framingham, Massachusetts. For faster delivery, call 1-800-656-4499. Call now. Saturdays on America's Voice, Bill Lynn and Brad Kina take a look at the issues facing America, now and beyond. Next revolution at its new time. Saturdays, 10 Eastern on America's Voice. Welcome to Legal Notebook. In legal news today, the Senate just minutes ago confirmed three more Clinton judicial nominees. Two of these had breezed quickly through the Judiciary Committee just before the Senate adjourned last November. The Senate today confirmed Barry Silverman to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Richard Story to the U.S. District Court in Georgia, both by unanimous consent without a recorded vote. The Senate also confirmed Ann Aiken to the U.S. District Court in Oregon by a vote of 67 to 30. Senator Mike Enzi of Wyoming led the opposition to Aiken, citing her 1993 decision sentencing a child rapist to just 90 days in jail. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit has struck down a rule allowing federal government lawyers to violate local legal ethics rules. State legal ethics rules prohibit communication directly with parties in a case when they are represented by counsel. A U.S. Department of Justice regulation exempts federal government lawyers from complying with these rules. 
In this case, Justice Department investigators contacted employees of a defense contractor accused of contact, contract fraud. The appeals court said that existing statutes did not give Attorney General authority to issue this regulation. The court also rejected the argument that this federal regulation preempted the local ethics rules. The decision in U.S. v. McDonnell Douglas Corporation was written by Judge David Hansen, appointed by President Bush. The Illinois Court of Appeals has ruled that a pregnant woman can refuse medical treatment that would benefit her preborn child. In this case, a woman nearly nine months pregnant refused a blood transfusion on religious grounds. The state ordered the transfusion and the mother delivered a healthy baby. The legal issue was whether the state had legal authority to override the woman's treatment decision. The state appeals court distinguished this from an abortion case in which the state's interest in the child's life is compelling, at least late in pregnancy. Instead, the court said that pregnant women have no obligation toward their preborn children, and therefore the state cannot override their decision. The decision in Illinois versus Brown was written by Justice Mary Thies. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that states need not honor gag orders issued during lawsuits in other states. In this case, a Michigan court prohibited a former General Motors employee from testifying against GM in a similar lawsuit over an allegedly hazardous pickup truck. The legal issue was whether courts in other states are bound by such an injunction. The U.S. Constitution requires that states give full faith and credit to judicial proceedings in other states. The Supreme Court concluded, however, that this does not require enforcement of the kind of gag order issued in this case. The court unanimously announced this conclusion, though split on the best rationale for it. The decision in Baker v. General Motors was written by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, appointed by President Clinton. And finally, as the Senate came back into session, more than 100 grassroots organizations told them that activist federal judges undermine self-government and liberty. In a letter delivered to each U.S. Senator yesterday, these organizations representing more than 35 states stated their commitment to promote judicial restraint. This is the third time senators have received the same statement in the last year, and the new signers bring to 466 the number of organizations united on this issue. The Senate is expected to consider several controversial nominees in the next few weeks. And Kathy, of course, that's going to be our subject today. We're going to talk about uh, at least one of them in particular, some of the issues that make uh, this particular nomination very controversial. And I'm sure we'll also get to the comments of the Chief Justice in the last couple of months and the reaction to those comments. Mm -hmm. uh, up next, the battle over judicial selection. President Clinton calls for a quick up or down vote on his nominees. Will the Republicans stand and fight? That's our topic for discussion when we return. You're watching Legal Notebook on America's Voice. Back in a moment. Oh no, I forgot Valentine's Day! Don't panic. A dozen red roses are always the perfect gift. That is, if they didn't drop dead in days and cost over $60. This year, give her beautiful silk roses that last a lifetime. Forever Roses for only $19.95. She'll be delighted when Forever Roses are delivered right to her door in a florist box filled with a dozen of the finest silk roses wrapped with baby's breath and a personalized greeting card, all for just $19.95. But wait, call today and we'll include a second dozen absolutely free. That's two dozen long stem roses handcrafted from the finest silk to stay as beautiful as the day you sent them. Just call this toll-free number now to send Forever Roses for only $19.95. And we guarantee delivery for Valentine's Day. Call now and have your credit card or personal check ready. Sorry, no mail-in or COD orders accepted, but supplies are limited. So to order for this Valentine's Day, you must call right now. Backed by popular demand, it's the original Miracle Eraser. This powerful paint varnish and rust stripper races through any job so fast you won't believe your eyes. See how it actually erases old paint as if it were chalk, wipes away old varnish as if it were dust, leaving the surface smooth as glass and ready to refinish. And Miracle Eraser makes short work of rust like this. The varnish on this wood must be 30 years old. On the left, ordinary sandpaper. On the right, Miracle Eraser. Just look at the incredible speed and ease. Miracle Eraser molds itself to the shape of fancy woodwork, easily stripping clean every corner and crevice. Don't throw that away. Imagine from this before to this after in just minutes with Miracle Eraser. From boats to bricks, tools to antiques, furniture, and more. Guaranteed to strip paint, varnish, and rust faster and easier than anything you've ever used or your money back. 
Call toll-free now to get not one, but six giant Miracle Erasers. Now for only $14.95. Order Miracle Eraser now. America's Voice, turning talk into action. Police, prosecutors, and prevention programs, good as they are, they can't work if our court system doesn't work. Today, there are large numbers of vacancies in our federal courts. Here is what the Chief Justice of the United States wrote. Judicial vacancies cannot remain at such high levels indefinitely without eroding the quality of justice. I simply ask the United States Senate to heed this plea and vote on the highly qualified nominees before you, up or down. Welcome back. To many viewers of last night's State of the Union speech, President Clinton's call for that up or down vote on his judicial nominees probably sounded like a reasonable request. After all, isn't, a ju isn't judicial selection a presidential prerogative? The Clinton administration would have us believe that naysayers in the Senate and conspirators on the right are bent on subverting the process and leaving scores of judicial seats vacant. But what are the facts? In the Senate, is it simply a rubber stamping body? What if a judicial nominee would simply be a bad judge? What recourse does the Senate have? Here to discuss the issue is Anita Blair, General Counsel for the Independent Women's Forum, and Alex Acosta, Director of, for the Project on the Judiciary at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Welcome to you both. Senator Hatch yesterday, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, gave a speech to the Federalist Society, and he raised some of these issues. Uh, before we go into talking about specific judges, I know, Alex, you were there, as was I. What was your reaction to Senator Hatch's speech? Well, the, the senator reiter reiterated his uh, comments that he made about a year ago, um, saying that he was opposed to judicial activism, that he would take steps to, uh, to oppose judicial activists in committee and on the Senate floor. Um, but the point that he emphasized again and again is that the Senate needs to take time to consider these nominees. It's not a rubber stamping body. Um, it must consider the nominees, carefully scrutinize them. In more than one case, a number of new facts have been presented to the Senate that the administration did not discover that have caused a, a lot of people to question the qualification of the nominees that have been brought before it. And if you look at the numbers and if you look at the record, um, the, the Clinton administration takes well over 400 days, I believe about 450 days, to nominate someone, yet the Senate takes under 200 days to consider them and to confirm. Uh, so I think his request that, that they give him the amount of time that's reasonable and necessary is, is very reasonable. And, and, you know, is, is the discussion about the judicial selection process, is it wise to let it become a numbers game? I mean, my dad was a math teacher. He said liars figure and figures lie. You can, you can find numbers for any point you want. Is that, is that a solid basis for discussing this very important issue? No, it really isn't because there's another half to this problem, and it's a half that Chief Justice Rehnquist mentioned and that gets routinely ignored in these kind of discussions, which is that we are feeling the lack of judges because we have way too many federal laws. And in the context of President Clinton's speech last night, he was talking about crimes. He was talking about crime prevention, police and prosecutors. Well, crimes, by and large, occur in intrastate commerce, and therefore the United States Congress should not have any authority over them. Those should be strictly state matters, and we should be looking to the states to enforce them. Unfortunately, for many years now, Congress has been federalizing just about everything that happens, and therefore these things end up in federal courts with a commensurate demand for more federal judges yes, that so shouldn't I, be I necessary. Suppose if judges had less to do, or if federal <laughs> judges had less to do, we wouldn't even be having a show on this topic because there would be less at stake in picking them. Although there are a record number of federal judges currently sitting on the bench, e even if you exclude the senior judges, uh, there are more active judges today than there have been in the past. One of the interesting statistics that Senator Hatch brought up yesterday that I hadn't heard before was this disparity or, or the, the um, comparison between the vacancies about 12 years ago and the vacancies today. W w w tell our viewers what that was all about. That's right. Well, if, if you look back to the Bush administration, um, I believe there were 97 vacancies at the time when the, uh, when the Senate recessed. And at that time, a number of, uh, a number of liberal groups, indeed, uh, were saying that uh, the Senate was proceeding far too quickly and that the Senate should slow down and the Senate needs to take a closer look at the nominees and scrutinize them more closely. 
Uh, there were 97 vacancies then. Uh, currently, there are only 81 vacancies. Uh, going a little let, bit. Let, let me guess. The liberal groups aren't saying completely anything. different story. <laughs> well, and, and the other point and that was interesting about those numbers was this fact that the liberal groups weren't just saying slow down, but were bragging that this is nearly full employment was the term. Well, that's right. Uh, that happened during the first uh, first years of the Clinton presidency. Um, after his first two years when the Democrats controlled the Senate. Tell you what, let's, I have, we have a, a graph of the, the number of vacancies, an average for each year since 1990. That's uh, graphic A. Let's put that up on the screen so people can see the line in the middle of that graph is, is when Republicans took over control of the United States Senate. And people can see that before they took control, when the Democrats controlled the Senate, vacancies were consistently a lot higher. Senator Hatch cited one, ex one year when it was up to a hun almost 150, and since Republicans took control, re vacancies have been consistently lower. Now, some people would say to the Republican Senate, that just means you guys are confirming too many judges, but that's the, you know, the, the, the pattern, that those are the facts about vacancies. But, but indeed, the Clinton administration, where there were 63 vacancies, um, uh, told the Senate that they had done a great job and, quote, nearly reached full employment in the federal judiciary. And that's the last year that the Democrats controlled the Senate. Yet, to, uh, at the end of this past year, when there were 65 vacancies, all of a sudden they started calling for a judicial crisis. Uh, and, and, and 63, 65, not much of a difference. And, you know, what about uh, the Chief Justice's statement in his report about the vacancies? Uh, he, he hasn't, this isn't the first time he has said that. Uh, any difference today in how that's being used? Who's pounced on it? How they're trying to use it? The president had the chief justice right in front of him last night and could, you know, acknowledge him right there as having right, said right. that. Well, he's speaking, of course, in his capacity as more or less the, over, the manager of the federal judicial system, and he is trying to make sure that they have the resources that they need to be able to do their job. And I think that's about the end of his mm -hmm. statement. Um, interestingly, in 1993, when um, I was looking into a gender bias task force in the D.C. Circuit here. I had occasion to look back at the last year of the Bush administration. I discovered that when Bush left office, there were 120 vacancies, and a very large number of those, you know, 80 percent or so, had been waiting for more than a year to be considered by the Democrat Senate. Uh, and at that time, it was purely a political game. They simply didn't want... Um, this president, you know, President Bush's nominees to get in when they thought that if they simply hung on for a while, they would be able to get a new nominee entirely. That's right. And well, in fact, Rehnquist has asked a, the Democrat, sen democratically held Senate to mm -hmm. um, hurry up to, to confirm right. the awaiting yeah, nominees yeah, the as well. Same, I mean, he makes his, this the is same the same speech. speech it's not the comes fact. every time. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and so he's kind of doing his job, and that's one way we yeah. can look at it. We've got to take a break right now, but we'll join our discussion about judicial nominations by calling 1-800-5000-638. We'll be right back. I know these are disturbing pictures, but if all you feel is pity, or perhaps even guilt, then I ask you, please, don't watch this message. Hello, I'm Angela Lansbury for Child Reach, and we need people who want to help. Throughout the world, in many of the poorest countries, there is a wonderful organization called Child Reach that is making a profound difference in the lives of children just like these. For just $22 a month, just 72 cents a day, you can become a Child Reach sponsor and not only personally touch the life of a needy boy or girl overseas, but also help the child's family and community achieve the goals they have set for themselves. Think of it, just $22 a month, and a little girl like this will never feel the agony of dysentery from dirty water. A child like this will be able to go to school to learn and grow. Parents like these will never have to see their children go hungry again. And this community will strengthen through self-help programs that really make a difference. The little boy or girl you choose to sponsor from one of 40 countries overseas will become a real part of your life. And these 
will provide a window into your child's world. I'm so glad you've watched, but now that you have, what are you going to do? No, pity and guilt won't help. The answer is child reach for a needy child, family, and community overseas. And for you, the answer is child reach. So what are you going to do? Welcome back to Legal Notebook. We're discussing the battle over judicial selection with Anita Blair of the Independent Women's Forum and Alex Acosta of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. We'd like you to join in on the conversation by calling 1-800-5638. Well, let's talk a little bit about why all of this matters and what's judicial activism anyway. Yeah, I mean, is, is Humpty Dumpty a judicial <laughs> activist? <laughs> Well, in an ideal world, it shouldn't matter. Congress should write the laws, and judges, as they are supposed to, should interpret what Congress wrote. And, of course, the people elect Congress, so if we don't like the laws, we elect new people to write them. Uh, in this case, however, when we talk about a judicial activist, we talk about a judge who wants to be a congressman who wants to write the laws. The trouble is that when a judge writes a law we don't like, we have no say over it. Now, let's give, give us some examples of, of where, you know, simply by what they call interpretation, uh, judges can not only tell us what our laws are, but literally change what our laws are. Well, there are a number of cases where judges have um, legislated from, from the bench. You see examples of the most well-known is Proposition 29, where uh, out in California, a judge simply decided he didn't like the proposition, and even though millions of California voters had voted for it and had adopted it through the democratic process. You had one individual who was life tenured, who, who sat for life as a judge, overruling the will of the people. Now, some people would say, uh, and sometimes they'll cite that as an example, that this is, that this is really political, that any time they overrule the will of the people, to you guys, that automatically means it's judicial activism. And, you know, it would be true if, it, you know, they usually will bring up, like, Brown versus Board of Education and all this other kind of stuff. Is it simply because a judge overrules the will of the people that makes him an activist? It, it, th th well, there's a, there's a difference between a judge saying, let's look at the law, and this is what I think is my good faith interpretation of what the law is, and a judge saying, I really am not very concerned about the details of the law. Let me make policy. And I'll give you an example on the other side of the political spectrum that makes the point. Uh, there was a judge in, uh, I believe, New York, who decided that abortion protesters who were motivated out of a deeply held religious view um, should not be held liable for blocking access to an abortion clinic. Um, now, most people's understanding of the law is that that's not the case, that whether you're motivated by religion or another uh, reason, if you commit a crime or if you do something that's unlawful, whether it's blow up the World Trade Center or block access to an abortion clinic, that should be unlawful. And there is a federal statute, you know, barring uh, protesters from blocking those clinics, and there isn't a religious exception that, in the statute. That's correct, and that's an example of judicial activism, and I point that out to, to prove that it's not a political game. Right. That may, that's a conservative judge at engaging in political activism and judicial activism and I'm glad you brought, brought abortion up because I always my favorite case of course is Roe v. Wade right. is that not the preeminent judicial <laughs> activist case and look and look we can see concrete results of the damage that judicial activism does to our country in this case it costs lives what are the other kind of results of judicial activism and um, why we are left powerless to kind of respond to it as as citizens of the, Uni of the United States. Well, I have a great example, which is uh, in the area of Title IX and sports. Uh, you may remember last year there was a case that went up to the Supreme Court called Cohen versus Brown University, in which uh, Miss Cohen, who was sponsored by the National Organization for Women, sued Brown under Title IX of the Civil Rights Act, and she claimed that somewhere in the in the emanations from the penumbra of Title IX was uh, an obligation for colleges to provide just as many women's sports team slots as men in their inter Basically, intercollegiate Basically, she made that sports. up. Yeah, yeah. Not it written anywhere. Invented. It was invented. Not only, however, is it not written anywhere, but there is a provision in Title IX which says this shall not be interpreted to require any numerical quotas or proportional representation. So, so a judge so not only finding what's not there, but ignoring defying and, what is. Yes, and so now you might go back to the Congress and say, folks, what are you going to do about this? And they say, well, 
what can we do? Right. We already said it's, there shouldn't be quotas. We've, it's, we've it's done it's our job, yes. in other words. Is Someone it, else is, is doing our job. Is it fair to say that President Clinton's nominees as a group tend to be more toward the activist end of the spectrum than the restrained end of the spectrum, realizing that there are there might be individual exceptions. But as a group, Alex, as you've looked at the pattern, uh, is that where they tend to fall? Right. Drawing, drawing broad generalities, they do tend to fall uh, in the more activist category. And another thing that we see is over time, uh, judges do tend to become more activist. So if they're activists now as a group, uh, it is likely that over time they, they will grow be. On we the ain't bend. seen nothing that, that, yet. That, yeah, right, right. right, yeah. right. When, well, the, the reason I ask that is we also have a graph of the uh, the percentage of the federal bench. That's a graphic B that uh, President Clinton has already appointed. The number of positions that exist and the percentage of those that have been filled by President Clinton already. And you'll see it's already about a third of all the sitting judges are of the kind, uh, Alex, that you've said. And of course, they start from. You know, down that right. down that spectrum a little bit, they're going to end up even further. Right. Let's uh, let's go to Robert in Erie, Pennsylvania. He's on the phone. Uh, you're on Legal Notebook. Uh, I have a question. Why is it wrong for Republicans to procrastinate at a time like this in their in their uh, confirmation of the president's appointees to judgeships? But it was all right for the Democrats to procrastinate a few years ago when it was the other way around. And incidentally, they, they re, the Senate just approved those three. You probably know that. Right. Yeah, we reported on that at the, t at the top of the show. I mean, that's the classic double standard right. that's point. going on in Washington right, right now. Al although the point to make there is simply because someone else does something wrong doesn't mean that you should go ahead and do Oh, come on, wrong, Alex. You know? Why not? It's, well, it's, those are the rules, th but, right? But that's, you know, if, if you have principles, you have to follow those mm -hmm. principles. And that really is what I think and hope distinguishes these judicial nomination battles from those that, that were criticized, such as Judge Bork's battle and, and others that, that were heavily criticized. What, what amazes me is that in the legislative process where Congress uh, will, will enact a bill and then the president can either say yes or no, which is the reverse of the nominations process, but in the legislative process where there's a difference of opinion between a Republican Congress and a Democratic president, nobody, the media included, acts as if the president just has to lay down and rubber stamp legislation right. uh, and that, that there shouldn't be any differences that affect the way the process is conducted. But when it comes to nominations, there are real differences of opinion about the principles that should be involved and suddenly the, act, you know, the, the presumption is that it ought to be rubber stamp and then you've got to justify somehow why it's not. Why is there, there well, that difference the of perception? The complication, I think, arises out of the Constitution, which says that the president makes these nominations. It is not a case of uh, Congress coming to the president saying, hey, here's a person we think would make a great judge. They are in a completely reactive position. And it, it, it's a little bit like the president in his veto power. He's reactive, but he's got a, a little more effect in um, sort of sending it back and saying, if you change this and this, I'll sign. It. Uh, Congress is not able, uh, you know, under any even the broadest stretch of the reading of the Constitution to say, hey, if you would only send us Joe Jones, why we would uh, approve him. But Tom's <laughs> right in this frustration. I mean, Clinton can be seen as a hero by many people in his camp for vetoing a bill that is against their principles. But our guys in the Senate, concert people who care about ju judges being um, uh, restraining themselves and being conservative in the nature of simply interpreting laws and, and what have you instead of making laws, when those people finally get the guts to stand up, we don't see yeah, them lionized. They're called and, 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 and right. the country. Their, their term is long over before the judge dies. The judges, the federal judges are appointed for life, and that is a big problem here. But, but there are also political differences between a nomination um, fight and a legislative um, uh, 